If you like to book heretics to the torch, then the Night Valiant might just be for you. There's a certain relic called Traitor's Pyre that does exactly what it says on the tin. Hello and welcome back to Auspex Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where we're currently doing Night Fortnite, two weeks of focused Imperial Night videos, in addition to our regular Space Marine content. As you've probably guessed, today we're looking at the Night Valiant, the more fun version of the Castellan that likes to charge headlong into the enemy lines, carrying close range death dealing weapons of enormous power. In this review we'll take a look at the unit's rules, any ways that we can get further buffs out of it via relics, warlord traits and households, and then we'll talk about how we can run it to maximal effectiveness on the battlefield. In the background the Knight Valiant has all the subtlety of a massive onrushing battering ram, charging headlong into the enemy's lines and dealing out death in an unbelievably short amount of time. The Conflagration Cannon, the massive triple barreled flamer, burns with a heat that can melt straight through battle tanks, and its other weapon, the Thunder Coil Harpoon, is a hilarious actual harpoon that pings out from the Valiant and then can be reeled in and fired again. When it hits an enemy tank, it discharges its enormous amount of stored electric energy, obliterating its target in an explosion of arc light. All very nice. So let's see how it does on the tabletop. So the Knight Valiant is one of the Dominus Pattern Knights, with the advantages and drawbacks that that brings. Its base movement is 10, it has a ballistic skill of 3 up, but only a weapon skill of 4 up, so not quite as accurate in close combat. Strength 8, toughness 8, 28 wounds, so a little more than its Questorus cousins, 4 attacks, leadership 9, and a 3 up save. In its cheapest incarnation, it is 583 points, so a significant investment to your army. And of course, it is a Lord of War choice for Imperial Knights. We already mentioned its primary armament, the Thundercoil Harpoon and the mighty Conflagration Cannon. In addition to this, it's equipped with two twin melter guns, four shield breaker missiles, and a twin siege breaker cannon. The Valiant does degrade, so when it's down to 14 wounds or less, its movement will drop to 7, it'll be weapon skill 5 up and ballistic skill 4 up, and when it's 7 wounds or less, its movement is only 4, its weapon skill is a pathetic 6 plus, and its ballistic skill is only 5 up. Though as its conflagration cannon will automatically hit, then this isn't actually such a big deal to the Valiant. Talking of that conflagration cannon, its range is 18 inches, its heavy 3d6, automatically hits the target, as all flamer weapons do. Strength of 7, AP minus 2, and damage 2. Strength 7, AP minus 2, damage 2 is an amazing all-round profile. It'll get through heavy armor quite well, it'll deal with multi-wound models quite well, and it'll wound everything quite well. It's pretty strong basically against anything except toughness 8 units, so really is an all-purpose weapon. That range of 18 inches means that the Valiant has to get somewhat close to use it, which is probably its main drawback to stop it hitting enemy units that are further back in the battle line. The Thundercoil Harpoon is a very funny one hit or one miss wonder. It's heavy 1, 12 inch range, strength 16, AP minus 6, damage 10, and you can reroll failed hit rolls when it's targeting a vehicle or monster. And in addition, if 10 wounds damage weren't quite enough, then it also inflicts an additional D3 mortal wounds when the target suffers any failed save from this weapon. So in reality, it's going to be inflicting between 11 and 13 wounds on any target if it does any damage at all. Now this weapon does sound very reliable and amazing on paper. It'll be hitting on 3s, re-rolling, and it'll be wounding on 2s, which you could use a command re-roll to re-roll if it doesn't wound. Unfortunately, it does have major drawbacks. That 12 inch range means that it might not ever get in range of a heavy target if your opponent is screening with infantry units, or if your opponent just doesn't have any large vehicle units in his army. Also, a lot of hard targets tend to have invulnerable saves, and even if the target only has a 5 up invulnerable save, having a 1 in 3 chance of this weapon doing nothing even after you've hit and wounded is pretty painful. Your opponent is almost certainly going to command reroll any invulnerable save that they make against this weapon, because it's just so valuable to be able to have the 1 in 3 chance to keep your keep their model alive. So in reality, if you are shooting against anything with an invulnerable save, then you're then you're typically going to have a less than 1 in 2 chance of actually getting that damage through. All that being said, it is a very devastating weapon and it does hit home, and if you point it at a mid-sized tank, there's a very good chance that it is going to be one-shotted with that weapon. 
It's just a bit unfortunate, say, compared with the Castellan's Plasma Decimator that is pretty reliable on getting quite a lot of wounds through. So you don't really have turns where you completely whiff with it quite as much. It's a lot more likely to do, say, 6 wounds a turn rather than 10 wounds every other turn. So you can plan your other firepower around it quite a bit better. Those twin melter guns that it's mounted with are certainly not to be underestimated. Usually melter weapons when they're bolted onto knights just come as one extra melter gun and aren't really worth considering or repositioning your knights to take advantage of. However, when you have four of them, they become roughly equivalent to another primary weapon on your Dominus class knight, and it is certainly worth trying to get within 12 inches to use them if you can. This synergizes quite well with the Valiant, which is already going to be trying to get within 12 inches to use that enormous harpoon. So even if that does miss, hopefully the melter guns will inflict a few wounds as they go. Its further options are the Shieldbreaker missiles and twin siege breaker cannons. As stock, it comes with four Shieldbreaker missiles and one twin siege breaker cannon. You can further swap out one extra Shieldbreaker missile set for an additional twin siege cannon. This will cost you 11 additional points, and personally, I would recommend doing this all the time. This will really maximize your damage output on turns one or two, which are generally the most important turns for ensuring that you get damage output. The twin siege breaker cannons have a very decent damage profile. They're heavy 2d3 each, 48 inch range, strength 7, AP minus 1, and damage d3. So roughly the equivalent of firing two auto cannons, but a little bit more swingy with the damage and shots. The shield breaker missiles are very nice. They're 48 inch range, heavy 1, strength 10, AP minus 4, damage d6, and they ignore invulnerable saves. The downside is that you can only launch one of these per turn. So if you have four of them on your knight, you're only going to be firing one a turn until you run out on turn four. I'd much rather have the twin siege breaker cannons both keep up their fire for the entire game and just take the additional missile shots on turn one and turn two. To be honest, with a Valiant, you can't necessarily expect that it's going to be living the entire game anyway, because you are going to be throwing it up towards the enemy and putting it in harm's way if you want to get the most value out of it, so it is quite likely to die before turn 3 starts anyway. As with all knights, it has a few special rules. The Iron Shield will give it a 5-up invulnerable save. Because it is a Dominus class knight, it will cost you 3 command points to rotate Iron Shields to give it a 4-up invul save. So that's an unfortunate thing that's worth bearing in mind. It has a boosted explosion called Dual Plasma Core Explosion. So when it's destroyed, you roll 2 dice instead of 1. And if either result is a 6, then it blows up and inflicts d6 mortal wounds on everyone within 2 d6 inches. If the stars really align, and you roll a double 6 for the explosion, it will inflict those d6 mortal wounds on everything within 3 d6 inches, so that could be inflicting mortal wounds on a massive swath of the battlefield. This also synergizes with the stratagem Noble Sacrifice, which is 2 command points to give your knight a higher chance of exploding, and then you roll 2 dice, and if either of those are 4+, plus, then it explodes 2d6 inches, and if both are a 4+, plus, then it explodes 3d6 inches. If and when your Valiant does go down, it's often a very worthwhile stratagem to use, as you'll have got close to the enemy, hopefully they'll have loads of units around it, and you can hope for trying to hand out d6 mortal wounds to every unit within 2d6 or 3d6 inch range. And finally, as all Imperial Knights, it has the super heavy walker rule, meaning it can fall back from combat and still shoot and charge, and can fall back over infantry and swarm models, and suffers no penalty when moving and firing its heavy weapons. So overall, the Knight Valiant is a close range shooting unit. It ideally wants to be hanging out around 12 to 18 inches from the enemy, blowing them away with its enormous conflagration cannon, and hoping to one-shot some enemy tanks with that Thundercoil Harpoon. It also has no aversion to charging and crushing weaker enemies under its titanic feet, but bear in mind that it won't be quite as efficient doing this as your Questorius Pattern Knights. So what ways can we buff up the Valiant to get the most out of it on the battlefield? And there's one household that stands out in particular above the others for the Knight Valiant, and that house is Hawkshroud. The first reason to pick Hawkshroud is that the Relic Conflagration Cannon is called Traitor's Pyre. We'll get onto that in a second, but it is one of the best relics in the Knight's Codex, and it takes that already nasty Conflagration Cannon to the next level. Unfortunately, it's only available to the Questor Imperialis households, so it means that you often will want to pick a Questor Imperialis household to access this. The second reason for this is that House Hawkshroud's stratagem, Staunch Allies, allows you to fire Overwatch 
with a House Hawkshire model when an enemy charges a friendly Imperium unit that's within 12 inches of your House Hawkshire knight. This can be any Imperium unit, it doesn't have to just be one of your other Imperial knights. So if you have some friendly guardsmen who are trying to screen the Valiant from getting hit in close combat by something, then you can use this. The reason that this is so powerful is that it will allow you to fire overwatch with that conflagration cannon, which is so much better than any other weapon for firing overwatch, because it automatically hits, so it's just as strong in the overwatch phase as it is in the shooting phase. House Hawk Shrouds. Household ability also isn't too bad, as it will allow your knights to degrade more slowly, so it will keep up its movement value for a longer time, which is quite useful because you really need that movement value to synergize with its close range weapons. Because of Traitor's Pyre, all of the other Quest or Imperialis households are worth considering, but most of them do buff close combat as opposed to any form of shooting. And while the Valiant isn't averse to tangling cl in close combat with enemy units, it's not exactly a specialist knight in doing so. So I would prefer House Hawk Shroud if you're mainly choosing the house for the Valiant, but if you are choosing a knight to accompany some gallants from House Terrin, for example, then the Valiant isn't a bad shout as it can access the Mega Flamer still. The Mechanicus Houses also offer some positives. Unfortunately, you don't get to use Traitor's Pyre, but you do get to use some of their other bonuses. House Raven synergizes very, very well with the Valiant, as models with this household trait can advance and still shoot to full effect. This could mean that you get up to an additional 6 inches movement per turn, which when you're trying to get in a 12 inch range weapon in range of an enemy tank, is incredibly useful and could make the difference between you being able to shoot or not being able to shoot. So House Raven is very nice for this. House Tyrannus is generally very good for all knights because of that 6 up feel no pain, making them just more durable across the board. And the Valiant has a lot more firepower than it does durability when compared to other knights just because it's so much more expensive. On a points per wound basis, the Valiant is the weakest defensive of all the Imperial knights apart from the Castellan. And it's also going to be charging up into close combat so will be more likely to be killed early. So a defensive buff is great. The Tyrannus Stratagem, which allows the knight to get back up after the opponent has killed it, is also amazing on a Valiant, because that Conflagration Cannon will still be hitting just as well as it did when your knight is on a very wounded profile. So you can get this knight back up and still be fighting at pretty well near full efficiency, even if you don't use Machine Spirit Resurgent. Crass isn't too bad a pick on a Valiant either. It actually really ramps up the Valiant's close combat potential and makes it as good as a standard Questorius Pattern Knight. Because it only hits on a 4-up, you get to re-roll all of the hits that weren't, meaning it'll hit 3 out of every 4 times, which is actually better than standard Questorius Knights with stomps. Also, it has access to the Headsman's Mark, which can further amplify your Valiant's damage-dealing potential to vehicles and knights. It particularly makes the Conflagration Cannon better against these targets. And finally we have House Volker, its Firestorm protocols allow reroll hit rolls of 1 for a model when you're targeting the closest unit. Usually this isn't particularly useful as you'll often have chaff units in the way, but if you're moving to get those heavy anti-tank weapons in range within 12 inches, then it might be that your Valiant is actually targeting the closest unit as it has to be so close to use those weapons, so this one has a little bit more value than it normally does. Moving on to Relics and Warlord traits. Ion Bulwark is a great one for amping up survivability. As we said, the Valiant isn't actually the toughest point for point, and it has a lot of heavy firepower so the opponent will be trying to kill it as soon as possible. Ion Bulwark is particularly good because it means that you won't have to rotate Ion Shields at all, which comes at a massive premium on Dominus Pattern Knights. Also, the Armor of Sainted Ion is great, for that 2-up save to increase durability, or Sanctuary if you think that you're at risk of being charged by the enemy. Although bear in mind that the Knight Valiant has pretty decent overwatch with that Conflagration Cannon. Let's mention Traitor's Pyre now though. So this is the Relic Conflagration Cannon. It's got a range of 18 inches, heavy 3d6, strength 7, AP-2 and damage 2. So just the same as the standard Conflagration Cannon. But the big difference is that you can reroll all failed wound rolls against any targets. So this almost doubles its effectiveness against Toughness 8 models and adds about 40% more damage against anything that you're wounding on a 3-up. The value of this really shouldn't be understated. It turns your already general purpose conflagration cannon up to inferno mode, so it's now a genuinely very high damage weapon against anything in the game, and even things that it was already good against, it's still even further better against them now. If you're playing Quester Imperialis households, 
and you're taking a Knight Valiant, I would 100% include this every game. Let's move on to stratagems now. We've already talked about Rotate Iron Shields and Noble Sacrifice, so we'll move on to some other things. It can still Thunderstomp to try and take out an enemy unit that it's been in close combat with. It has Ion Aegis, which means if you don't move you can give a 5 plus invulnerable save to all Imperial units within 6 inches, which isn't ideal because you ideally want to be moving as fast as possible towards the enemy. There's Oathbreaker Guidance System, which is now 3 command points, and this will allow you to fire a Shieldbreaker missile at an enemy character, even if that character is out of line of sight and you wouldn't normally be able to target it. This can give you a very reasonable chance of one-shotting the enemy Warlord, but bear in mind that this is a 3 command point stratagem and command points are so valuable to Imperial Knight armies. The chance is also less than you'd probably expect, as you're only going to be hitting on a 3+, you still have the chance to fail the wound roll, even if it's on a 2+, plus, and from there you'll still have to roll higher than the character's wound characteristic to one-shot him. If you're, say, targeting a Space Marine Captain with 5 wounds, then you'll still only one-shot him on a roll of a 5 or 6. Even if you're burning a command reroll to do this, it's still not very reliable at all, and I'd only do it if you absolutely think that the low chance of killing the character is actually worth it for the amount of command points that you're spending. Otherwise, just fire the shield breaker missile at something that you can target, as this is free command points wise. I certainly wouldn't be using this as an auto to include every game. For Questa Mechanicus models, then we also have access to Machine Spirit Resurgence to ensure that it's shooting on top profile even when heavily damaged, and Benevolence of the Machine God to ignore mortal wounds on a 5 up for a phase, which could be more of a consideration than normal because you'll be throwing this guy into the heart of the enemy most likely, so might be hit by a bunch of smites. And we've already talked about House Hawk Shroud's specific stratagem, Staunch Allies, which is just brutal on this guy, particularly with the Traitor's Pyre Conflagration Cannon. So how would I run a Knight Valiant on the battlefield? I honestly think that the Valiant is one of the more tricky units to use out of the Knight's Codex. You have a Knight that costs an enormous amount of points, so you need to make sure that you're getting that value back from him. But at the same time, you're incentivized to throw him up into the middle of the enemy to use those close range weapons, otherwise you won't get the value out of him. So you need to maximize the risks and benefits of putting him closer to deal out damage to hard targets, and overexposing him so he's going to go down to enemy firepower. The Knight Valiant would be a very high pick on my priority list for giving the Warlord trait Iron Aegis to, or failing that, then the Armour of Sainted Ion would be another big pick if I wasn't already committing to giving him Traitor's Pyre if I was running him in a Quester Imperialis house. You're typically going to want to deploy him towards the front of your deployment zone to try and get the close range weapons in on the enemy as soon as possible. If you have allies, then it's certainly worth screening the Valiant to protect him against enemy charges or enemy reserve units coming down to shoot him from close range with nasty guns. This is particularly more viable if you're running him with Hawk Shroud to be able to unleash that stratagem when they charge the screening units. From there, I would move the Valiant up the board, try and at least get him into that 18-inch range for the Conflagration Cannon, and if you have the option, try and get that 12-inch Mega Harpoon in range though I would never base my entire battle plan on assuming that that harpoon is going to go off and kill a vehicle in any given turn. It almost certainly will yet let you down just when you need it to deal damage the most. I'd probably try and keep the Valiant supported by at least one or two other knights, so that if something does come and charge into your Valiant that's su suitably tanky to tank the Overwatch, say for example another Knight Gallant or a Lord Discordant or something like that, then at least you have another unit to counter charge afterwards to hopefully rescue the Valiant the next turn and make the unit that charged him pay for their presumption. Against shooty armies, I would certainly consider each move with an idea to charge the enemy. If you can get him in range of several units, I'd certainly consider using the Conflagration Cannon on the unit that's the furthest away from the Valiant and then attempt to charge the uh, unit that's nearby as if you can kill a unit with a conflagration cannon in shooting, and then also stomp one to death in close combat, then you're getting more value out of the Valiant. In general, Imperial Knights need to be active in both the shooting phase and the fight phase to truly get their value, otherwise they're generally just slightly overcosted shooting units. Even if you're faced by a melee opponent, if you charge in, there might be a good chance that you could do enough damage to the melee unit that they won't be able to adequately hit you back. I've had some good success charging Bloodletters, for example, with Dominus Pattern Knights. 
and when you stack the shooting damage that you can do to them on top of the close combat damage, they'll often be failing leadership tests and losing the rest of their unit. And of course, when the Valiant inevitably dies, try and make it so he's in the middle of the enemy army, because being able to blow up on a very, very reliable two dice on a four up will certainly let you hand out a bunch of mortal wounds to all the enemy units around him. That means that even if the Valiant does go down, then he could still potentially drag down a decent amount of his points cost with him. So overall, I think that the Knight Valiant is certainly a strong unit in the Imperial Knights Codex. He's a lot more balanced versus the Castellan, now the Castellan got that points increase. Personally, in terms of tournament play, I prefer to use Knight Crusaders over the Knight Valiant, mainly because they're a little bit tankier point for point, and they're also longer ranged, so their guns will be effective at 36 inch range rather than needing to get within the slightly more dangerous 12 inches that the Valiant has to if you want to get the value out of him. That being said, the Valiant can be a very very good unit when things go right for it, and it certainly is a threat that the opponent has to deal with before they can feel any sort of safety for their advancing enemy army. Thanks very much for listening, please let me know your thoughts on the Knight Valiant yourself, and feel free to subscribe to Auspex Tactics for more Imperial Knight videos over the next week. Tomorrow I think that we'll be having a look at the relics section for the Imperial Knights and going over in a bit more detail when we'd want to pick them up for specific knights and specific matchups. So I hope to see you guys in the next video.